Good evening, everyone. I am Saranya Bose, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology, curated under TMYS Review in association with the Center for South Asian Studies, University of Hawaii. Under this theme, TMYS Review March 2023, we'll talk about language and provincial narratives. The topic for today is women's language of rebellion. We are honored to have Professor Devnath Patak, Malashri Lal Ma'am, and Shreyashi Gopinath Ma'am as our esteemed speakers for the panel. We were, uh, thank you for joining us. I shall now uh, quickly introduce our speakers. Professor Devnath Patak is a founding faculty of sociology at South Asian University, New Delhi, and has previously taught at Hindu College, Jamia Millia Islamia, and he was a visiting scholar at Brown International Advanced Research Institute at Brown University, a Charles Wallace Fellow at Queen's University, Belfast, a visiting scholar at Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, and scholar in residence at Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He has authored the books In Defense of the Ordinary, Everyday Awakenings, and Living and Dying Meanings in Methali Folklore. He is also a founding editor of the popular public space on YouTube, Gulp Lok, which curates significant dialogues. Malashri Lal Ma'am has retired as a professor from the Department of English, University of Delhi, and has 16 books to her credit, including In Search of Sita, Finding Radha, and Tagore and the Feminine. Her specialization is in literature, culture, and gender studies. Her poems and stories have been published in Indian literature, Confluence, The Beacon, online portals, and anthologies. She's also a member English Advisory Board of Chaito Academy. Lastly, Shreyashi Gopinath Ma'am is a young Bharatanatyam dancer and teacher based out of Delhi, a Ministry of Culture Government of India scholarship holder. She is empaneled with IRCEN. Shreyashi Gopinath Ma'am, she has also performed across geographies, India and abroad. She is felicitated with a number of titles such as Nit Nitya Mani from the government of Orissa and several others. She established her institute Shreyashi Gopinath Dance Academy in Delhi in the year 2014 and has two branches in Delhi. Now, without further ado, I'd like to request Malashri Lal Ma'am to please present her views on today's topic. Uh, Ma'am, you're muted. Good evening, everyone. I'm indeed delighted to be on this panel with uh, eminent speakers, and thank you, Sharanya, for that generous introduction. So I'm going to be talking about women's language of uh, rebellion, particularly with reference to literature, which is my area. And uh, I'm going to begin by quoting an interesting line from Gayatri Spivak, who says that the word woman is not something for which one can find a literal referent without looking into the looking glass. Now, if I were to look into the looking glass, I would see myself as an academic and a writer and a, uh, an editor of, who has seen four decades of change in the position of women in Indian society. And having been the director of women's studies at Delhi University and my lifelong engagement with writing about women, uh, I have certain views uh, about women's language and rebellion, which I want to present to you very briefly today. Um, first and foremost, I think we need to understand patriarchy in a particular context. And the context in India Feminism has to think in terms of family and community. We cannot dissociate it. So a, a lot of the feminist theorizing that comes out of Western academia that we used to study in the classroom and still do, uh, doesn't actually work when it is implied and uh, placed, implemented and placed in Indian situations. So it seems to me that certain words will have to be redefined in the Indian context, words like victimhood, survivor, the disadvantaged, the marginal, because the point is that we work in a class and caste structure. We also work within a very sharp economic pyramid. 
And quite often when I used to be lecturing to audiences abroad, I was asked, how come you have uh, women who are prime ministers and others in important positions, but the baseline woman is a deeply disadvantaged and an extremely poor person lacking education and lacking almost subsistence quality living. Now, the answer to that is very difficult to get to because we really have to look at the Indian context for the subject that we are speaking on. And one needs to consider that in the 19th century, as when feminism, as we understand it today, first became a term of reference, we didn't have a man versus woman kind of a position. Uh, the leaders of uh, a lot of the women's emancipatory movements and laws, etc., were men. I mean, one thinks of Ram Mohan Roy and Mahatma Gandhi and Sri Aurobindo, Swami Vivekananda, and then many, many others. So women and men worked together. And it seems to me that in India, since family and community, as I just mentioned, is so important a uh, context, men and women need to work together towards feminism and an oppositional a relationship doesn't do either side any kind of a good. From that background, I move to three quick literary examples. According to me, the founding foremother of feminism in India is Sarojini Naidu. She, uh, her dates, of course, are 1879 to 1949. She was a poet and also a politician. And what was uh, very, very remarkable about, uh, about her was that she succeeded in both the fields. Now, when she came under the mentorship of Gopal Krishna Gokhale and also Mahatma Gandhi, they both sort of exhorted her to choose either politics or poetry. And she said, no, I'm going to do both. And although she was known as the Nightingale of India, she was equally known as uh, an extremely polit important political leader. She was the first woman president of the Indian National Congress and then became the first governor, uh, a woman governor of uh, in, in free India and Uttar Pradesh. So uh, what, what I want to emphasize is that we need figures in India who are functioning in an independent sense of dignity and well-being as women, but who are also able to get along with the overall structure of family and community. I'm just going to quote one short uh, line from Sarojini Naidu's political speeches, because that is where her language of rebellion comes in. And just listen to this. She said this at a conference in 1908. This conference invites all communities concerned to give their earnest endeavor to save Hindu widows from the customary disfigurement to ameliorate their condition by providing them with educational facilities and a widow's home. So this is way back when she had this kind of a foresight. Let me move to another literary example. And this is from a very different part of India and much more in, in our times, around 1979, I would say. This is Rama Mehta from Rajasthan in a way, but she had her education upbringing in Bombay. Very inspiring figure according to me because I grew up in Rajasthan and I know the feudal context in which that novel is set. But Rama Mehta had joined or qualified to join the Indian Foreign Service in those days. She fell in love and married a fellow officer. This is Jagat Mehta. The rules in those days were such that a married woman could not be a part of the Indian Foreign Service. So she had to leave. And she spent the rest of her time doing a great deal of social work for the upliftment of women in Rajasthan, particularly in, in Udaipur, which was the home of her in-laws, a very conservative feudal family. So the novel Inside the Haveli is a masked autobiography in a sense, and utterly charming and very powerful and inspiring because she shows how one can live within the ambit of family and community and still bring about social change. So the protagonist of the novel, whose name is Geeta, she decides to open a school inside the Haveli because the conservative Rajputs are not going to send their daughters out for education. So she said, all right, I'll bring education here. 
No, then she realizes that the girl children will not be sent unless there's an adult accompanying them. So then she decides to put in adult literacy classes inside the Haveli. And thereby, a certain kind of an understanding of the value of education very gradually begins to come together. Now, to accomplish this in a segregated gender space, you know, the women and the men have different quarters, the women wear veils, parda, they eat separately, they have, there's no communication between men and women in that kind of a society, and women are strictly prohibited from crossing the threshold as the term goes. Nevertheless, she is able to bring about a certain kind of a change. But we also have to look at feminism and what I'm saying in our present context. And when I was rereading the novel for the purposes of our uh, discussion today, I uh, went back to a passage and said, hmm, how am I going to interpret this one? So here is Gita. I'm reading a line from the novel. She came to love the veil that hid her face. This allowed her to think while the others talked. To her delight, she had discovered that through her thin muslin sari, she could see everyone and yet not be seen by them. So what I'm suggesting here is that the language of rebellion is not only words. The language also is in culture, in artifacts, in dress, in attitudes, in behavior. So language has to be understood in that broader context. And it is the overall package that Gita presents to this conservative family that after all, I'm dressing like the bahus in the home. I'm observing the parda, but I'm still wanting everyone to go to school and get education. So it's not a confrontationist attitude that succeeds, but it's a collaborative attitude in her idea of rebellion that actually brings about the success that this story gives us an account of. Uh, my third and final example today is from the diaspora, because so many Indians go away to, particularly to America and to Canada, and we get their writings in English. Here I'm going to take the example of Bharti Mukherjee, uh, 1940 to 2017, who was one of the first to actually make an impact as a diasporic writer. And the book I have in mind is called Jasmine is a story of a girl from a Punjabi village whose actual name is uh, Jyoti Vij, but that's not fashionable enough. So once she lands up in America, she decides to call herself Jasmine. And later on, she's also called Jane by one of her husbands. But what is important is when she lands on the shores of America, there is threat to her physical safety. And there is a person who uh, in a way dupes her almost commits rape, and she attacks him back because she takes on, in her own mind, the attitude of goddess Kali, that you have to fight back against evil. Even as a woman, you're not weak. You're actually very, very powerful, and you have to call the Shakti inside you in order to counter the evil forces of society. So Bharti Mukherjee used that kind of an idea to talk about what she said is the maximalist act. And the maximalist act basically means that you come into America with a kind of a fluid identity, and, uh, and then you make what you can of the life around you, but quietly and in a very subtle way, you express your rebellion, not in an assertive, aggressive, uh, in your face kind of a manner. And pretty much versions of this kind of diasporic writing expressing the rebellion of women is also seen in the more contemporary names that we will recognize, such as Jhumpa Lahiri or Chitra Divakaruni Banerjee. So, uh, so that's really my point, that it is the negotiation with the past which creates the kind of literature that we can understand the women's language of re rebellion. You, women don't work in isolation. The Indian woman has to take into account the cultural past, the linguistic past, the family and the community context, and then find her ways of expressing rebellion. I think in a, in a, in a manner which is subtle, quiet and strong, rather than being aggressive and angry about the situation that is surrounding us. Thank you very much. 
thank you so 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 much ma'am uh, <clears throat> that was a very engaging uh, discussion um so uh, what i'd like to say is um <clears throat> since you mentioned about this collaborative effort so uh, do you think that this this figure of this of this woman who is uh, liberated in a way but then again it's very it's it since it's not on the face it's uh, a much more uh, she's also keeping within the uh, uh, indian culture or indian tradition but then she's also not a, a, a woman who is uh, very oppressed but do you think this is the new wom woman it's a big question as to what we mean by indian tradition but i think a very important thing that's happening is revisiting mythology my own books on sita and radha have tried to look into how we have to open up the gaps and silences in those stories they were not weak women it's just that their story was told in a certain patriarchal way so my sense is that women have always had a place and if we remember that that inheritance of being strong without being in your face and combative uh, the results are better because combat only brings enemies whereas if you are able to work from within the system it brings about a more enduring change thank thank you so so much ma'am uh, next uh, we'll move on to uh, professor devnath patak sir please present your views on today's topic thank you saranya uh... um i concur with the basic premise which has emerged from professor lal's presentation and along that line my perennial uh, curiosity has been about the idea of rebellion uh, i always wonder whether rebellion can be linear process whether it can be monochromatic <laughs> whether rebellion can be something which one singular voice whether there can be a a singular definition of the process called rebellion and uh, and therefore i believe that the premise which has emerged from professor lal's presentation helps us uh, get into what i would uh, present as some sort of anthropological detailing of the polyphony of rebellion Uh, which is very suitable for uh, female folks move toward subversion of certain kind a uh, subversion which may also not appear prima facie as subversion but in a uh, deeper sense they provide with plenty of opportunity to think about redefinitions even though it is coupled with certain kind of reconciliation unfortunately in popular political literature in political scientific literature these words such as rebellion resistance defiance they appear very uh, monolithic they appear very linear very simple it, it seems to involve some kind of zero sum power game in which there would be one winner and one loser somebody will fight somebody will win somebody will lose whereas when it comes to uh, women's language of you know the way language is enacted in that sense language rebellion in that language is interestingly not that monochromatic not that monolithic it is not ossified as far as uh, the idea of winner and loser is concerned there is a great deal of uh, kinship involved as far as women's articulation of resistance is concerned and along that line i tend to always think of women's articulation as uh, women's language of rebellion as some sort of broader speech act and i'll come to that idea of speech act in a short while but before that uh, i must mention that we come across plenty of historical biographical examples of women's speech act in which there is on one hand certain kind of opposition to the established normative order but on the other hand there is also 
an opening for series of negotiations to be performed with various allies in the process of rebellion. There is a tendency to win over allies irrespective of the gender. There is a tendency to find new alliances in women's articulation of rebellion. And that takes us invariably into various domains of experience, literary domain of experience is one which about which Professor Lal has talked about, but there are this larger cultural context in which we find several such articulations. Before I get into any of those instances of articulation to make the matter more concrete, let me also say that when we speak of language, language of rebellion if we speak only of language probably we will be restricting ourselves to the structure of language which will be in typical structuralist sense bifurcated into language and parole those who study linguistics would be very well aware of how enabling or disabling how how much possibility and constraint arises from this kind of bifurcated idea of language Whereas for those who are more into understanding performances along the line of languages, they will almost join in someone called Austin to ask as to what all one can do with language, just the way he asked about uh, the ways of doing things with words. Likewise, one can think of, you know, asking another question, which is what all one can do with languages. And that would invariably take us to the idea of speech act, where once again, there are three four realm of forces uh, delineated by some of the linguists, uh, locutionary, elocutionary, and perlocutionary. For someone like me who takes interest in performances, uh, for us, perlocutionary force of uh, the realm of perlocutionary force becomes important where the speech act is performed in the negotiation with others, which means that essentially, language is employed in speech act in order to find more relation forge more relations than severe relations and in that regard if we consider language of rebellion as some kind of speech act one would have to take into account variety of alliances variety of relationships various kind of kinship women would be forging that's my area of interest that's where, as an anthropologist, I turn to some of those cultural details where new kind of alliances are suggested. And I'm not the only one. There are many predecessors who have worked along this line and who have tried to show as to how alliances work very well. Kinship alliances particularly work very well as far as female folks' cultural politics is concerned. For example, there are scholars who have tried to show as to how in Western UP in Haryana, women would be singing songs and through their songs, they would not only articulate criticism of the dominant kinship normative order, but on the other hand, they would also attract male folk uh, to join them in their criticism of how patriarchal principles are operationalized. In that regard, I also think of some of the some of the popular instances. For example, if I, one just turns to uh, something very dominant of our time, that is Bollywood, one finds several such examples. Today, uh, people think of we think of the, the Bollywood lovers would think of some of these film actresses who are very articulate, very uh, outspoken, and uh, unfortunately, they are also criticized for their outspoken tendencies. Um, and they defy some of the norms of uh, some kind of you know standardized version of uh, beauty and uh, you know the uh, fit and fine prim and proper look uh, but then it goes back in time uh, one can go to devika rani one can go to uh, many other predecessors in the history of cinema and one would find examples various kind of examples of defiances Interesting thing about those defiances are that, you know, through those defiances, relationships were created, not severed. That's very interesting uh, um, uh, reality about the language of rebellion, which was articulated in the cultural trope, in popular cultural trope. In that regard, I just, I, when I was thinking of, you know, today's panel, I recalled one instance 
which is very popular. It also appeared in the in the wonderful book uh, uh, Munni Nasreen Kabir had uh, done, and in that book on on Guru Dutt, and in that book there is this uh, peculiar uh, description about how we, uh, Bahida Rahman was discovered by Guru Dutt, and then Guru Dutt thought of signing her for. Uh, signing uh, offering a contract for her to sign uh, to work with uh, her uh, it was the first uh, film for which uh, she was signed it was cid directed by raj khosla and when gurudat and raj khosla both met vaida rahman first time and offered her the contract they requested her to change her name into some kind of more acceptable screen name which was the customary things those days every all actors male female uh, used to change their names screen uh, names were different from their real names um, you take the name of any of these actresses meena kumari madbala uh, nargis etc yeah, etc et and so vaida rahman was also requested to change her name uh, for the for this more acceptable kind of screen name uh, and she point blank refused she just did not accept this idea that she has to change her name with which she had grown up uh, and she found absolutely no problem in continuing with her uh, uh, family name and she stuck to that point even though it annoyed someone like raj khosla to uh, endlessly and uh, raj khosla had serious reservations about signing uh, wahida rahman for cid uh, the second point on which uh, raj khosla almost gave up was that wahida rahman insisted and she was very assertive even though she was not a very well known uh, star uh, that time she had just done a couple of films in telugu in south she was known for dancing but she was not a big star as such and she was about to make a uh, debut in hindi cinema even then wahida rahman on the occasion of signing that contract first ever contract in Uh, in the film industry made it very clear that one clause must be added in the contract that the costume that she would wear for any of the films gurudat production films the costume would be of her choice no director no producer no costume designer can impose a, a costume on her and she would wear what uh, suits her socio cultural personality so she took care of her socio cultural personhood in spite of the fact that she was joining an industry which had heavy demands from the actors and actresses particularly female actresses and wahida rahman stuck to her point and eventually a sensitive film uh, maker such as gurudat accepted both the demands both the important demands and this was how wahida rahman's cinematic kinship with some of her filmmakers including guru dat uh, commenced without any kind of compromise on some of these fundamentals that she had in her mind with this kind of instance one understands as to how in popular cultural domain too there have been always this possibility of being assertive as a female actor assertive female actor who can in the meantime also forge a new kind of alliances who can join in creative industry with her own terms and conditions and yet be open to form alliances this is just to suggest that the larger cultural domain gives that uh, creates that room has that room possible however it is uh, uh, up to the artists as to how one is spelling it out whether it is uh, spelt out in the way Uh, uh the 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 monochromatic rebellion would be spelled out in which there is only one winner and only one loser there is no space for negotiation whereas in this this kind of processes of you know rebellion one finds that there is a speech act in which in which defiance and negotiations happen together contestations and reconciliations can unfold together and from that one comes to the folk context of india and i being one of the students of folklore who has taken keen interest in mythical folklore to begin with have been always aware of the fact that through women's songs one get not only a criticism of how the institution of patriarchy has functioned for ages 
one also gets a, a, a sense as to how a larger collective effort can be curated by female cultural politics uh, uh, in which there would be always a possibility of new allies joining in in that you know in that protest and it does not become a linear protest in that regard there is always this you know backward and forth back and forth move uh, happening i remember in this context uh, uh, famous anthropologists like veena das would be uh, writing about punjabi women folk and she would call women folk register as a register of poetry which may seem to be offering a too subtle uh, something which uh, professor lal offered to uh, referred to uh, it may appear too subtle but then through that subtlety uh, through that poetry of registry uh, uh, register of poetry in the larger kinship grammar women would try to offer alternative perspective about the world about the societal world about the social conditioning and it however leaves great deal of possibility it gives choices to other social actors to understand to fathom decode the subtlety of that kind of criticism uh, through which alternatives are offered just like in the case of punjabi uh, women folk one can also discover something of similar kind in uh, as far as uh, mathili uh, uh, women folk uh, is concerned where we get to hear not only the criticism of uh, uh, patriarchal uh, uh, norms but there is also an invitation uh, naming uh, invitation to certain kind of you know male roles considering them brothers uh, husbands and uh, distant relatives avuncular uncles naming them there would be an invitation for them to join in this larger body of cultural emotional politics in which subversion is invoked but it is invoked along with an invitation uh, to join this uh, larger uh, uh, possibility of you know uh, transformation however once once again one has to be reminded that in this whole process transformation is not some kind of you know ngo driven program uh, which will be planted from above or somewhere else it will be parachuted instead it is always expected that the transformation would emerge from the ground where this criticism of the status quo is offered and that in that regard i believe language of rebellion as far as it comes from women in cultural context offers uh, far more profound possibilities than uh, it happens in the organized uh, political body organized civil society bodies where things are rebellion is agenda driven uh, in the cultural context the agenda may not be very uh, articulate but then there is an eye at uh, a more relationship based transformation a transformation a change a subversion a defiance a rebellion which is not at the price of relationship that's where i'll stop thank you thank you so so much sir it was very interesting and uh, what i think is uh, since you mentioned about uh, cultural uh, politics i think uh, perhaps the earliest uh, if not the earliest uh, probably a very important a very significant uh, figure in that uh, context would be uh, mirabai uh, i mean uh, because we find uh, uh, through mirabai uh, a culture of 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 devotion and of subversion uh, i mean we i think we we, we all know about uh, the the culture the the family that she belonged from and uh, then uh, how she chose to continue uh, what she uh, believed in uh, so uh, that was very interesting to hear from you uh, so i i i think we'll we'll move on to someone who is i think more in touch with this is performative element uh, uh, in her work so um, we'll move on to uh, shreyashi gopinath ma'am uh, ma'am please present your views on today's topic thank you saranya uh after hearing um, professor lal and um, 
part of so also that um, there are many things that in relation to dance at least in terms of culture so uh, i'm basically going to be focusing on dance uh, and how um, women's language of rebellion through dance through art um firstly when it comes to bharatanatyam as an art form it it wasn't um, it, it's always been practiced by women and the the art form was and is still very female dominated so um in terms of rebellion and the things that we have to work around are very different uh number 1 the first thing was uh, back in the day when devadasis were uh, present they would they would they were given the privileges of um that any educated woman would get today so uh, back in the day before independence what a devadasi i mean not uh, just before independence but i'm talking about years ago uh, what a woman would what a devadasi would uh, was entitled to or what she uh, got the respect that she got and the command that she had uh, was i think somewhere along the lines it diminished especially so there was this book that i was uh, reading and there was this uh, quote where um rabindranath tagore's sisters and he were in he was invited for a dinner uh to the um to a british officer's uh, residence and the sisters weren't allowed because in their tradition they and custom they weren't allowed to wear, they never wore a blouse they just covered their uh, bosom with alta and that was normal that was how uh, free and uh, at least in in uh, when i think of it women women's um empowerment is all through uh, not just how much freedom they given but of course much more and there where it came to um when it came to their outfit they were told that they weren't dressed properly so they are not uh, they could not attend uh, this particular dinner which uh, when you read i think that is where our society started going down and um coming more from a matrilineal society it it does tend to um in my mind i tend to think of this whole um you know ro- uh, role the gender roles that where women have to fight for it i'm i mean since i'm born in delhi i hear a lot of uh, people talk about uh, how women need to um you know fight for even even when it comes to their rights just their basic rights and i think that that has never been the case now coming to dance uh yes the rebellion is um, there are many you know different languages of rebellion so like ma'am said the gaps the silences the working within the system that is um i think the way of uh, moving forward now um you know we have uh, different structures to the uh, art form itself and how do you push forward how do you um how do you break stereotyping an artist um where um just because a ravi varma painting had a sita drawn in a certain way or a god drawn in a certain way that does not uh show how the depiction needs to be done so it's i feel those are places where uh, as an artist as a dancer uh, from my side i have felt that we need to um push forward and um, talk about different aspects now when it comes to so multiple dramas that i have done personally have all been female oriented because of uh, coming from a very strong uh, background where women have had the opportunity and i i think that's that's the reason why it's it's been easy for me to associate and relate to characters like 
Kunti and um, especially, I mean, if we see Indian mythology also, most of these stories are, um, I think it's the women who are the driving force of that story. I mean, take um, Shantanu and Ganga, take uh, Sita, take, uh, you know, in the Mahabharata, Draupadi, uh, take Kunti. I mean, uh, it was just a small twist where, uh, you know, you see how strong the women are portrayed. So I think the language of rebellion through uh, art and through dance is to um, is to show how strong these women are and how one can portray them in a um, in better light and not to make them seem. Um, I think forceful would be a wrong word but to be uh to show what they were and how that's how the writing also was back then that these characters have been showed in a uh, very strong light and then you go down and you realize that somewhere along the passage of time things uh came to a point where women had to fight for it like um Pataksa was saying about Vahida Rahman how she had to go through with the process of saying that she will decide the costumes and uh, to say no to the name change and things like that. Those, I think, have happened uh, over time because we have um, we have been in a situation, uh, women have been put into a situation where they've had to, um, at some point, uh, put themselves out there and stand firm on their beliefs and crowns and in terms of dance also it is to do with um, i think the only way one can do it through dance is to take more female oriented topics or um, characters and portray it or a dance or art or any culture for that matter even writing i mean if, if you when i read coral's books i i see the strong feminine character and how uh, it's been portrayed where you can see uh, the character, the strength of the character and how firm they're on their decisions very clearly. So, I mean, concluding my um, uh, part is that I would like to say that I think the women's language of the rebellion has, it's, it is, it can be done only by um, working and uh, collectively, like how ma'am said, collectively. And how sir said also that um, in, a, in a silent but um, forceful way. I think that's how I would like to put it. Thank you so so much, ma'am. Uh, it was indeed very interesting to get a, uh, a, I mean, I mean, get a perspective from a from a uh, <clears throat> per performer herself. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, uh, since you mentioned about Bharatanatyam being a, a dance form being uh, mostly dominated by by v women, I I, I think uh, in the Indian context, uh, mm -hmm. dancing uh, or, or, or a dance is an art form is often attributed to women given the i mean i mean even now uh, given the very normative compartmentalized uh, gender roles that society uh, fits us into uh, so this is also from personal experience uh, and uh, i I've, I've, I've seen this that there are, there is a lot of um, uh, remarks thrown at a man for for being effeminate or or, or womanly when he is being uh, in, engaged in this, this art form. Uh, so as, as a dancer yourself and through your experience, how would you say that we locate this, this gap between dance and masculinity? Uh, see, uh, it's as a question, I mean, um, now dance, yes men are told uh, that you know they can look feminine while doing it but th that's only with Bharatanatyam I mean if you see other art forms if you see um, Kuchipudi they're all done by men 
uh, even the female characters. So the men would dress up like women and do it. Um, Kathakali, even Kathakali, the men would dress up as a woman and they would portray um, the characters. So um, like even in, so I'm from Kalakshetra where um, <laughs> she was very uh, insistent that all, firstly, that we have a lot of male dancers so that it's, uh, it cannot be only women who do the art form. Uh, number two, if you see poetry, okay, if you see poetry, uh, if we, when we do, when we dance, most of the poetry is written by men. So when they do it, or if it's devotional, you want to see the God as the lover and the, uh, the, um, the person who's writing, the, the devotee as uh, the female side of it. So, I mean, uh, I, I don't think it's wrong if a man portrays it in that way. I mean, is there anything wrong? It could be, uh, uh, the love could be towards uh, a male god, but in a female sense. And um, it's actually, it is easier for uh, men to portray female characters than for um, uh, women to do masculine. When a, and actually, when a woman does masculine uh, roles or uh, characters, it the um, it's very very difficult. It it is it it takes a sense. You have to see the body language. You have to go through multiple uh, layers of learning, observation, etc. In the same way, if you see um, the male dancers like um, C V Chandrasekhar, the Dhananjans, they're all. And these are very well established. Dhananjan sir has created a repertoire. They're all from Kalakshetra. They've, he's created a repertoire for uh, men in general. So it's, uh, I think it, it, you know, we, it's something that we have to get over, um, you know, having gender and uh, always at the back of anything, it, be it dance, be it, uh, be it music, be it uh, painting, be it writing, it, it is basically someone's personal choice and uh, commu the, their way of communicating, irrespective of gender. I hope I answered your question, Saranya. Yes, uh, thank, thank you so, so much. Uh, uh, so I think uh, with this, we come to the end of the panel discussion. And now I'll be moving on to the question and answer round. Uh, though I think I have already st started it, uh, but um, uh, my my question for um, my next question would be for uh, Malashri Lal, ma'am. Um, uh, so I want to ask you that uh, in your book, uh, In Search of Sita, uh, which you also mentioned today, you've talked about how how there is a much you know overlooked version of 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 Sita. Uh, uh, popular culture tends to ignore it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, about this character in your book and, and, and even uh, such character, representations of such characters in uh, other novels and how it is very seminal in uh, modern times? Um, you are you're mu muted. So uh, the book that Namita Gokhale and I co-edited, this is it, In Search of Sita, it was originally published in 2009 and then reprinted in an expanded edition in 2018. I mentioned the dates because when we started research on this book, which was around 2006, there was no talk about the alternate Sita at all. So it was one of the first books that actually opened up that territory of revisiting the Ramayans and looking for the less known Ramayans and the forgotten Ramayans and the folk Ramayans as Devnath would be very well aware of, which portrays a very different Sita from the inherited popular version of the Ramayan, mainly because of the TV series, that Sita was the shy, retiring, submissive uh, person. And, uh, and that is what prevailed in the popular imagination. 
So when we worked on this book, it was a lot more than just book-based research. There were lots of interviews that we conducted among our students in the community with policemen, with rescue workers, with uh, teachers, with uh, a lot of men folk actually, uh, religious spiritual leaders. And we realized that there is a hidden Sita that people don't really know about. So one of the key questions here is that if Sita was, was the kind of person portrayed in popular imagination as this woman who needed the protection of men and etc., then when she was under the control of the supremely powerful Ravan in Ashok Vatika, how come he never managed to even touch her? Now, that's a question which can only be answered when one realizes that here is a woman who has an immense sense of self-worth, dignity, confidence, and she can keep a powerful man away from her just by her sheer exercise of female personality. So that is just one of the many examples that come up when we looked at the Ramayans not used by Ramanand Sagar. So there we found very strong versions in Southern India, we found in uh, Himachal many versions which talked about the environmentally conscious life in the forest when Sita was using berries and ordinary material to cook delicious meals. So uh, then we found uh, the Chandravati Ramayana was still being worked on by Nobunita Dev Sen and she gave us something of her research before it was published. That is the only woman's Ramayana and you immediately see a different powerful Sita. So that's my answer, that you have to look into the gaps and silences and you find material about the strong, rebellious woman. Thank you so, so much, ma'am. Uh, now, my next question uh, would be for uh, uh, Pro Professor Devnath Patak. Um, <clears throat> At the current time, uh, with uh, so much of protests, uh, in woke culture, there's there's a lot of uh, people actually coming forward and addressing certain uh, uh, issues on 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 gender, uh, women's treatment, women empowerment in gen gen general. Uh, but then we also see, like I think we recently, I mean, I mean, it's very recent, maybe like two weeks ago. There was this very, very uh, horrifying uh, incident about this this woman, uh, Shraddha, I think it was her name being being chopped off and put in a refrigerator by by her uh, living boy boyfriend, um, and many such incidents, many such Shraddhas that we find. Uh, so, why, why do you, as a as a so sociologist, uh, see women as a gender? heading towards or, or, or rather the larger society heading towards in, in terms of women empowerment and equality. Saramia, you have asked most difficult question. Uh, I think you had saved it for me. <laughs> Frankly, uh, I would say I do not know uh, where are we headed with this, uh, with, with our uh, prophetic idea of uh, women's empowerment. Uh, here, I think in the context of today's panel discussion, one can only say that uh, some of the homegrown models of, if we, if we want to use the word empowerment, uh, some of the models which have been available for us, uh, uh, with us for a very long time, they have not been employed, uh, uh, they have not been promoted. Uh, our education also has not uh, sensitized us toward uh, some kind of archetypal, um, I would say, from mythology, from popular texts. Some of those are very important, uh, uh, even though they are mythological uh, in background, we have not dealt with some of those uh, models uh, of uh, empowerment or models of very clear-minded, assertive, a firm uh, feminine power and uh, whatever idea of empowerment we have tried to operationalize in past uh, five six decades if one has to say 
uh, one cannot discredit them. Obviously, they uh, might have been useful at uh, the ground level. Uh, they must be instrumental in bringing about certain kind of uh, changes in attitude, changes in terms of power relationship, uh, the gendered power relationship. But then one also understands the limitation of the ideas or the models of empowerment which have been planted upon us. Uh, they might appear very attractive, but probably they do not make us very powerful. Uh, they do not make us very firm, very clear. Somewhere there is a gap between what we preach, what we think, what we learn and what we are. Uh, our, the, I mean, the way our existence is organized, that is not really um, uh, touched upon. So I, I'm not referring to the example that you have given. Given, I do not know whether this kind of you know criminal examples, examples of crime, can be used to talk about something so positive and creative that we have heard from uh, panelists in this panel. Uh, it, I mean, the empowerment is when is when one is uh, able to. Uh, put into effect one's own free will, when there is independence of mind, when one is able to make free choices, really, in terms of what one could be, right, in terms of one's personhood, rather than uh, the kind of, you know, ideas which appear from commerce and uh, industries. Uh, if we uh, consider only those things are empowerment, Probably somewhere uh, it would not be empowering. It would be just fulfilling certain kind of attractive aspirations uh, rather than giving us really this kind of you know, courage and uh, will to stand for ourselves. It will be only giving us uh, very temporary fulfillment of certain kind of aspirations. Uh, I do not know whether I'm really uh, answering your question, but uh, I, but I don't think there is necessity to uh, get into uh, the cases of you know criminal uh, very unjust criminal activities which happen uh, very frequently unfortunately uh, in various parts it's not only about this particular case even otherwise you go to various parts of uh, north india south even south india badly infected by all kind of gendered violence uh, uh, criminal violence and uh, um, Yes, they, they are very, uh, they make us uh, uh, sad and uh, we, but in that sadness, one has to rethink what one has tried to uh, popularize through, uh, uh, you know, discourses. Instead, if we popularize, I mean, if there is a good discussion on uh, characters of mythological significance, not just to uh, rediscover mythology, uh, basically to... Uh, offer some kind of you know psychoanalytical alternative to us, such as this uh, Sita that uh, Professor Lal referred to, uh, Kunti. Some of these characters, if they are of, if they are developed into psychoanalytical alternative to uh, to us, uh, probably that would do a great a better service. Um, you you talked about Saranya. You talked about uh, Mira uh, by. Uh, someone can name uh, Akka Mahadevi and so on and so forth. Plenty of names one can come up with. And it's necessary to probably uh, put together some of these names and figure out various kind of models of empowerment which have been existent and unfortunately we have not paid attention to them. Thank you so, so much, sir. Uh, I think... Um, we are not left with much time, so I'll just uh, quickly ask the last question uh, for 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 tonight. Um, my last question is to uh, uh, Shri Gopinath Ma'am again. This this is a very personal question, uh, so <clears throat> I'd like to ask you that uh, what are the personal challenges or even uh, uh, challenges from a society that you belong in? Have you have you have you faced as a woman and as a dancer? Oh gosh, I can, uh, <laughs> the list is very long. Hmm. Okay, so um, in modern times, uh, sustaining as a dancer is, uh, is very, very, 
very very difficult to say the least um there are many times that um, people have questioned my choices uh in terms of the challenges where i have the reason uh, people think i've become a dancer or an artist is because either i'm not good at studies and that is the general perception i have been uh, there was a performance a very important performance in my uh, career which was the surya festival which is i think in any young dancer's career to be able to perform there is uh, is extremely prestigious and when i was going there someone told my this was the first time and my grandparents had come along with me and they they and my mom they've been the ones who have actually encouraged me to take this uh, up as a career and someone said that um, oh you picked this as a career because you're not good at studies or is this uh, then if you're not good at studies why don't you just get married that was the general perception now um sustaining our place as a dancer in modern times okay uh, keeping the other challenges keeping uh, the audience's interest in mind uh, what what could interest them that is a very big challenge um is the dance relevant is bharatanatyam as relevant do people associate and relate to uh, mythological stories anymore are they believers do they uh, if i'm performing abroad is it um the uh, do people even know the challenges that uh, sita faced or uh, uh, draupadi faced those um to you know the pressure that one faces uh, when it comes to one's own expectations the guru's expectations society expectations having to manage relationships because uh, there are times that you're so engrossed in dancing in practicing in uh, choreography in um uh you know in the performance the pay is less okay one has to teach have a teaching a profession also uh motherhood that is a challenge because say you you're a performer and you decide to um have a career and have a family how do you manage that because uh if you're becoming a mother you have to take a few years off for obvious reasons um and taking time off you know um can have serious consequences for a woman especially uh where you know okay for example me moving to reunion currently i'm saying oh okay if you're missing out on all the performances that are happening in india things like that um they can they can have a lot of consequences as well um and what are the challenges gosh the, the list is never ending i mean um okay sexual harassment does exist like it exists in every profession we hear about it in bollywood in i mean in movies everywhere so those are things favoritism nepotism and as a woman you have to you go through all these and because okay so i come from a reasonable background yet the costs are plenty and um at any point i know i can uh, talk to my parents about it but i'm sure there are a lot of dancers who don't come from that um privilege or understanding and it is it, it can be quite difficult especially for um you know when you're a young dancer you're impressionable there are multiple things that go on in your mind when it comes to um the challenges these days i mean such um just to name a few like you said you know uh just these these challenges these are you don't get sponsorship how do you get sponsorship although there are very few sponsors they go to the big names how do young dancers make it you know a, a young dancers like a young politician that's that's what it is but um having said that uh dance does uh, fulfill an aesthetic need for me or more like um creative emotional spiritual um that 
that need and it's it's not a way it's never been a hobby or a part time passion it's it is a um it is a strong way to connect and um you know as a as a person it's been a strong uh, ground for me and it's it does come with its challenges but which profession doesn't i guess thank you ma'am uh, with with this we come to the end of our se session i extend my heartfelt gratitude to professor devnath patak uh, malashri lal ma'am and shreyashi gopinath ma'am for this remarkable se session thank you everyone for joining us tonight